Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bon Calais, and this is Denise Jackson, my uh, curating partner, and welcome to Chain Letters. How are you, Denise? I'm doing great. Good to see you, Bon Calais, and right. thank you. Thanks to everyone for waiting um, a few minutes for us to get started today. Yeah, so we have a great show today. Uh, we have a great uh, artist that is joining us uh, along with Danny Simmons today, Derek Adams. So we're excited to, uh, to have him in a little bit. Uh, as you all know, we're doing this show, Chain Letters, because we were supposed to originally have a show in November uh, and uh, we decided to push it back to sometime next year. So this is a way to uh, promote the show and to get you all uh, ready for a great, a great exhibit next year. Yeah, and I'm really excited about our guest today. I know you have a relationship with him and Danny right. does as well, and he's a really exciting artist doing a lot of great things. So I'm right. excited for tonight. Yeah, so um, what do you say? Should we bring in, uh, you look nice by the way. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> I have to. I have to plan because it's dark. You know, now at this time of night, so we got to plan for lights and all of that. Right. Well, you know, the ambiance is nice. The, the, <laughs> Good. the setting, it's it's a, it's beautiful. Uh, should we bring in uh, Mr. Danny Simmons? Yes, let's do it. Okay. Am hey, Jen. Yep, you're in. Hey. All right, all right. I love those glasses, man. Thank you. Thank Pretty you. funky. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see you. <laughs> yeah, likewise, likewise. <laughs> good to see you. <laughs> you know, well, likewise. Good to be seeing you. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> well, um, this is our, our third uh, third show, third uh, panel event uh, of uh, Chain Letters. How do you feel about that? Uh, you know, I was thinking about that earlier today. I was like, this is the third one. We've been rolling on this, huh? Yeah, and they say three is a good number. <laughs> yeah. How many of these are we going to do? I have no clue. We're going to just into an in ad finum into in <laughs> we've got next month. We've got next month planned, and they're just going to keep going. So. Right. Well, we plan on having the show sometime, sometime next year, right? So we're going to at least do them up until the time that is due to to do the show, and then we'll do it to promote the show as well. Well, we're promoting yeah. now, but you know, to. Uh, yeah, so um, let's get into it. You want to talk about, let's talk about uh, your, your piece, The Way It Is. Um, well, I, you know, okay. It's a mixed media piece. Um, it's, it, it, it started, uh, it's part of a series I was doing, uh, mixing paint, fabric uh, on paper or canvas. This okay. is a little different. Um, the colors in the background, the yellow, the green, uh, and the blue, are really something that I printed on a piece of paper. So I, 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 I used my, uh, my phone, drew, drew something, sent it to a printer, got it printed. So mm -hmm. instead of working on a, a white background, I worked on a background with, with various colors already in it and started mm -hmm. from there. Uh, just to do something different, there was, there was no particular reason why. But I, I liked the, the, the way it turned out, the way the printing turned out. So I think I did about two or three of these. But okay. it was a lot of fun, and then I started uh, creating the, the, the what was going to go on top, I guess you could say, of, of the printed fabric. So it really is a mixed media piece. It's print, fabric, paint, and, and pigment. And mm. maybe some pencil in there, some charcoal in there also. Yeah, it's very cool. Is it on paper and then framed? Yeah, it's on paper. It's pretty large. It's like, you have, I can't think of a thing. Well, I, thought it, I thought it said like 29 by 37. That's probably it. Yeah. So it's yeah. a large piece. Um, and it, it recently got caught up in an exhibit mm -hmm. that we had in Philly, uh, a bunch of Philly artists that I, I, I loaned it for the exhibit. And when it came, it got stuck because the exhibit was supposed to be over in March. So right. it got stuck by COVID. It, didn't, it was in a local school. We were doing it for the kids and showing them different art forms. And so when they closed the school down, the paintings got closed in. And so it just came back home after after a little bit away. And I was glad to see it. 
<laughs> and right. I, I, I thought it would be a good piece to donate for um, our fundraiser for Rush. But maybe we'll talk about the fundraiser a little bit. But this piece will be for sale on Artsy for, you know, with the proceeds going to benefit our programs. Nice, nice. So, so talking about uh, Rush um, Arts Foundation, and, and of course, you, you just brought up a little bit about um, Arts for Life 25th anniversary. And talking about that particular piece, uh, that piece it goes around, starts like around 6,000, right? I think the, it starts that retail. So retail. We'll probably start to price somewhere around 50% of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, maybe 3,500 we would start the bidding at. Okay. So, it, you know, we give people an opportunity to get a really, really great, unique piece uh, with starting out with a low bid. Right. And how many pieces all together this year are being auctioned? Oh, I don't know. They're still coming in. Right. Uh, I think we probably have about 25 or 30 so far. Mm, Committed. Okay. I don't know if all the pieces have gotten there, but we've gotten some really great artists. Derek, of course, has right. donated a piece. And um, the great photographer, Dawood Bay, has donated a piece. We're honoring him also. Right. And then there's uh, Rena Banerjee. There's just a million different really great great artists that uh have stepped up to honor rush's 25 years in the arts and i know it's virtual this year how is that going to play out like how will people on the day of the actual event how how will we enjoy that i have to uh well we were going to do virtual but i have to thank you uh denise for for that because this this platform that you guys pulled together seemed a good way to me to uh, to kick the virtual event off uh, through StreamYard and various devices. And so um, I asked Bonkale to pull together a team um, to really execute this for us. And so they've been collecting interviews and they've been doing all the background, creating the uh, uh, the, the flyers and. The whole thing they're putting they're the, they're the engineers of it uh and I'm, I'm, probably, I'm honored mm -hmm. i'm probably figuring out more of what the content will be and who it is and you know keep trying to keep and, and getting bought in for the art art show but bankale is really uh and he has a great team uh are putting together the rudiments of what this fundraiser will be so if it don't go well, you you know who to blame. <laughs> Wait, hold, on, hold on, hold on. It's a two week uh, uh, art auction. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not talking that. about the art I'm auction. I'm talking <laughs> about the production. Yeah, the production. That's a two hour show that will be in the the middle of the the two weeks. And uh, I'm honored. I'm humbled to actually uh, uh, be um, um, producing this particular show. And um, I'm excited. We have uh, his niece Vanessa Simmons hosting the show. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of good uh, other um, exciting um, uh, special guests. And, you know, so it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. Denise. And I know we will probably, you know, talk a little bit more about it as we go. But what is the day of the actual like the production and the event that, that November 21st, right? Yeah. November 21st. I think it starts at eight o'clock. Eight o'clock Eastern, Eastern Standard, uh, five o'clock yeah, PT. Yeah, Pacific. and people will buy. People can buy tickets ahead of time and all that for the. Well, I don't think it's. I don't think it's a ticketed thing. I, we're not. You know, anybody can sign up. We will be asking for contributions, and we will right. be showing the art uh, mm -hmm. that's up for sale, uh, up for auction on Artsy. Uh, but anybody can join us. We're going to have some wonderful entertainment. Um, we have. Some some people who uh, epitomize not only the entertainment, great entertainment, but also they're all of them are artistic entertainers. Right. People that I would have personally programmed to be in my gallery. Uh, they could be on a stage somewhere, but they are. I'm not gonna say unusual, but cutting edge enough to be considered fine art instead mm -hmm. of popular right. entertainment. And a couple of them have been. Uh... They came through Deaf Poetry Jam. A couple of them have performed. Uh, none of them have been on the TV show. Okay. Both both poets were have been on the stage for me for the reunions to open up for me because I thought right. both of them represented parts of the poetry movement that were really, really, really powerful. But however, mm -hmm. they weren't. A, one of them 
really just wasn't around if you'd have been like very young at that point right um to be on the show but we opened she opened the show in philadelphia where we had 700 people at the, at the philadelphia museum of art and right. she killed it she right. killed she absolutely vanessa german mm. her name. And not only that but she is a top shelf internationally known fine artist who right. creates amazing amazing work sculptural work and some some uh, 2d work but mostly sculptural work uh talking about race race matters and and, and uh female um female issues but she uses sculpture and found objects and and paint because she paints all these uh to create these amazing fantastic art there she well, goes yeah. really cool. <laughs> and, very cool um, i have to say she's also, yeah works are amazing uh -huh. work is just like bam right but, um, those are very cool I, I have her in my collection in a number of i have some flat work from her and um i have one one sculpture that's amazing that's the centerpiece of of my living room right and you got uh, another one of them that has been on stage for you for that poetry jam is Derek oh, Cross. Yeah. yeah Derek cross who does something unusual which is which is he mixes beatboxing and mm -hmm. and poetry and so it's a very rhythmic, exciting, um, energetic performance that he puts out. And, right. and it's unlike anything else that I, I suppose maybe some other people do something similar. But for me, uh, seeing Derek many years ago, it was, it was it's unlike anything else that's really out on the poetry scene. And people just really gravitate towards it because it's so unusual and so well done that people are like, really? Right. Really, Are you really doing that? Did you? Uh, did Derek send his pieces in yet? Uh, yeah. You know what? Derek actually did send his um, his link uh, yesterday. Actually, you know, okay. he's right on it. You know, he's right on it. But it's like some really eclectic Denise, some really eclectic art, uh, artists performing, like Danny stated, uh, but, very artsy, like uh, uh, Leslie. Leslie, and, great and jazz. Derek, music. Derek, Derek also is a uh, fine artist. He also right. is a sculptor and a painter. So, and um, what was his last name? Cross. Cross. Derek Cross. Derek Cross. We, we call him D Cross. Okay. D Cross. Yeah. So you want to talk about? Also, he's also a painter, a sculptor, and a poet. And then we got Leslie Harrison, who's a jazz singer. Right. We have Marie Street. Marie Street is amazing. Who's just across the board with all the things we're doing. And then we have a young man named Chemist. Chemist. Yeah, Kemis is. Uh, I don't even know how to describe him. Kemis. He's, he's very, he's very, he's very unique. You know, he's, he's a very um, unique. He, poet he, musician. He's you know, he's sort of on the rap genre. Right. He, he sneaks in so many other parts of music. I mean, some of his stuff could sound like folk music with right. rap in it. Uh, right. Some of it could sound like jazz with rap in it. And he plays and instruments. He plays he's instruments good. while he yeah. raps. I mean. He's amazing. And yeah. this young man, how he's tied to fine art, we had our first or second opening at the gallery here in Philadelphia. And this young man comes in and, you know, I was making a speech about the gallery or something. something. And uh, he said, can I do a poem? I said, what? He said, I said, who are you? <laughs> what do you want, man? Yeah. And he said, no, really, can I do a poem for y'all? So I, I said, of course, man, you can do a poem. And he got up there and mesmerized the crowd. And um, so Chemist uh, has agreed to do something with us. So we're going to have really cool entertainment uh, that's really sort of tied into not emerging artists, but cutting it off on, you know, most of our when we did our big things in the Hamptons, it sort of had a different vibe on it. We would have celebrity, big celebrities doing things. And, you know, that's that's fun. But really, this really is the heart of the gallery, these type of artists, about what, what we can do when we mix across trends and when we mix across this. So we bring in a lot of stuff together that really speaks to who we are and who Rush Arts is. Mm -hmm. and, and I know a lot of your audience knows why this is such a special um, celebration this year, but if you can maybe tell the people who don't know about this being your, you know, what, what kind of year it is, the 25th anniversary. Well, you know, um, 
maybe for 28 years, I was uh, 30, maybe 30 years. I was giving art shows. But 25 years ago, I um, formally started Rush Philanthropic Arts Foundation along with my brothers, Russell and Run. And I would say this, it's not a specific date, but this year would mark the day that we had our big fundraiser at um, the Puck Building, and we had Run DMC perform and Eartha Kid perform, and we raised the money to um, open a gallery and start giving, you know, we see philanthropic arts foundation giving money to arts programs that work with children, and so that that would be what this year is who we are working with emerging artists and children, and and bringing the arts to underserved communities also. Mm -hmm. you know to, to put it in places in front of people who don't really get to see the arts as much as you know people who are first in the arts right yeah that, that's really special to be 25 years is a big milestone so congratulations yeah, i mean yeah. it's it's been you know we've been up and down i mean we've never closed so but you know some right. things were harder than others yeah. uh, we got the fundraising thing down pretty good once we started going to the hamptons and you know we started having this big art for life gala but the first few years were rocky you know we we tried things and they didn't work but you know it was a learning curve right that's and, what you do right that's what you do in the art normal. world right yeah mm -hmm. that's that's pretty normal you know mm -hmm. you know one of the one of the great things one year uh we spent a hundred thousand dollars and raised 80. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and you know russell personally bankrolled that year you know, uh, that was like in the beginning. That was like the second year or the third year. Uh, Russell said, "Well, we can't let this fail," and so I think he put in a quarter of a million dollars that year just mm -hmm. to make sure that we stayed open, so the flow people stayed employed. Um, so yeah, uh, but after that, we started getting it together and started building, and building. So the last fundraisers that we had in the Hamptons, we raised well, well, well over a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So. Our goal is nowhere near that for Philly because it's a different type of operation. But uh, we're, we're, we're hopeful that we'll raise enough to get us through one full year, um, give some people that are part time a little more time and right. and um, and and do a few more things to the gallery. But to the galleries, because we have two uh, to make sure that uh, we're stable. Hmm. So, OK, well, let me ask you a question. Um, before we bring uh, Mr. Derek Adams in. Now, the, the piece that, that we are displaying this year, is there a connection uh, to um, to Derek? Is that, a, is that a piece, or am I thinking of another piece in reference to uh, mural? But was that piece, is that one of the pieces that's being made into a mural? No. Oh, okay. So I'm thinking of another piece. Yeah, we'll, we'll, another piece. yeah, yeah. We'll get into um, the mural thing when we bring Derek into the, uh, the show. So are you are you all ready? I'm yeah. Ready. Yeah. And we got we got Derek ready. Awesome. Okay. All right. All right. Well, and I'm gonna just um, give a little small bio on on Derek before we bring him on. We're excited to have him tonight, and both of our artists tonight have been in numerous shows and exhibits, and they both have garnered many awards and honors. Um, we just want to give a little background on our special guest tonight, Derek Adams. He's a Baltimore-born, Brooklyn-based artist whose multidisciplinary work spans painting, collage, sculpture, performance, video, and sound installations. Derek received his MFA from Columbia University and his BFA from Pratt. Derek is a recipient of a Robert Rauschenberg Foundation Residency, a Gordon Parks Foundation Fellowship, a Studio Museum Joyce Alexander Wine Artist Prize, and a Lewis Comfort Tiffany Award. Um, and as I mentioned, he's been the subject of numerous solo exhibits and a lot of really cool projects. So we're happy to welcome Derek. Okay. Yes. Oh, exactly. Hey, what's up, what's up, Derek? <laughs> what's, what's How's up, it going? Mr. Adams? <laughs> yeah, so I made the Baltimore. Derek's my cousin. Well, Bonkle ain't knows, but Derek's my cousin. Right. So, that, yeah. That's funny because that's how I know you, uh, Danny. Uh, so, so Derek and I have known each other since I was like eighteen, right? So I knew, I knew Derek when he was an emerging artist. I was trying to be an emerging artist, and you know, of course. Uh, Derek was an amazing artist. One one uh, 
weekend, I guess, we went to New York and you, you took me to uh, a show that uh, yeah, Danny was having. Yeah, Danny organized, yeah. Danny, yeah, Danny was having, and, and that's how we connected. I was like about 18 years old. But um, yeah, so we, you know, we go way back, man. This was like a brother to me. I was uh, at Morgan State uh, and uh, Derek pretty much opened up his family to me. You know, his mom was like a second mom to me. His sister was like a, a sister to me. So I got I got a lot of love for uh, Mr. Adams. So same, same. Uh, yeah. Same with LA. So um, first thing we want to do, man, is, is give our condolences. I guess we're giving our condolences to the both of you. You yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, um, uh, because of your your aunt pa uh, passed. Yeah. So oh, yeah, and and we we appreciate you taking the time to uh, you know to do this panel coming on the show, and. Uh, with um, with that being said, as a, as a kid, I want to start with this with, with you, Derek. As a, as a child, um, was it the inspiration of having uh, artists like Danny Simmons uh, inspirational to you to to want to be an artist? Um, yeah, I mean that's one of the reasons I moved to New York uh, when I was a younger artist. Um, I had an uncle who passed. His name was Cliff, Cliffy Clifford Brown was a commercial artist he was really into advertising and he helped me a lot with my technical uh drawings as a younger younger person so i had like some introduction into art um at a very young age but um when i became you know much older um late teens early 20s i started to connect more with with danny in new york and i would spend time just kind of hanging out with him in williamsburg uh, in bushwick where he lived and had a studio and i would hang out with him and my cousin jamel his son and just come up on the weekends when I had time because I was working and going to school. But I was I knew I was going to move to New York. I just knew that um, Baltimore was not necessarily the place for me to grow as an artist or just being around creative people. And, um, and so Danny, you know, was, it was exciting. I was coming to Brooklyn. I was coming to Williamsburg when it wasn't so nice like it is now and kind of hanging out with Danny and, you know, walking his dog and hanging out with my cousin Jamel. So I got like a, I got like, you know, I got like a. It was about art, but it's really more about, I didn't come in like an artist coming to New York. I came into right. New York first with my family and then learning like uh, uh, the things that they were into and being around them and just, you know, helping out where I could. And I just learned a lot just being around, you know, being around and being present. And so eventually I decided to go to Pratt and I moved to Brooklyn. And Danny had just, you know, also Danny was, you know, evolving as an artist and as a, community um, person at the time, because he started doing all these different endeavors that not only was happening in Manhattan, but they also were happening in his own, his neighborhood of, of Clinton Hill um, at a time where there was nothing happening um, uh, creatively for the community um, at the time. And that was really amazing because everyone was very, um, just they were ready for it, you know? And people always say like, when people had people into their houses, you know, because all people always had to think about having people into their houses. And I was just talking about this to someone last week. I was like, Danny would have these barbecues and openings in, in his space, the corridor, and people were walking around his house and he had like these priceless African artifacts. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and nothing really, ha nothing happened. Nothing I, that I know of ever happened with just the local people um, coming in and out of the house. They were really appreciative of Danny letting him into his space. Right. And he wasn't like, he wasn't walking around following them or, right. you know, <laughs> asking like, where are you going and nothing like, like that, you know. It was like such a level of trust um, that was developed and I was able to witness. And so I think that really influenced the way that I look at community and how I deal with people and how I re relate to other artists. You know, I always see people as being really on the same, all as being really the same, kind of working towards the same goal. But also, you know, I became more interested also in people who are not artists, like the regular Joe Smo, I, I um, Danny calls them, <laughs> um, who just are interested in you know what's going on, what's what's happening in town, like you know, like they were just interested in something to do. They were you know people were looking for stuff to do, and Danny right. basically opened up his house, created all the opportunities that were free for people mm -hmm. to come from the neighborhood and just kind of hang out, you know, and. Right. I met a lot of artists like that too, you know, like multi generational art, you know, artists, um, and very different levels of their career, just being like in the mix of all of that. I, I, you know, I, you know what? Before you go into, 
Derek was instrumental in uh, the development. He came into the scene that he described, but he was instrumental in, even though I had a gallery in Brooklyn and a gallery in Manhattan, when Derek came and we asked him to curate some shows and then we made him the curatorial director at Rush, he elevated what we were doing. Uh, he dug deeper into the arts community that I was able to do in, in extracting emerging artists, people that, that from his generation uh, that I would have never found. I would have never, you know, they might've come to me uh, themselves, but Derek brought a whole generation of great artists along with him. You know, having absolutely nothing to do with me except if I had a place. Right. You know, it, it was like Derek said, I'm over here and we're doing and I'm doing this at my uncle's place. Mm -hmm. There you go. We call we're actually cousins, but he would call me his uncle because I'm, right. I'm a bit older. And the 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 culture of the gallery became much more energized, even though it was a, the highest energy place in New York City already, it became highly energized. And to this day, one of the things that Derek brought was a way of looking at art as not stuff on the walls, but as part of a moving, living, breathing culture. And so, and like part of hip hop, but not directly related to hip hop, but that was his generation. Right. And so it had an energy that really helped change the way people looked at art and who artists were. And they just came along because Derek had the energy and I had the place. Right. And I, I just wanna, I, well, I was about to say something as far as what Derek was saying, but I kind of want to kind of touch off of, of what both of you are saying. First of all, Derek, you're right about D, because I remember just even like he would do certain things like have a movie show for like one of his best friends he grew up with. The catch there though was that his best friend was blind. So he yeah, would invite yeah. all of these people over and I was like the youngest up in the bad way would invite me over to watch the movie and the, his blind friend would be there just like loving it, I guess, because they would watch old movies and he'd be remembering every scene. So that's yeah. the type of dude, you yeah. know, Danny is. You, uh, uh, along with what with, uh, uh, Danny is saying in reference to the arts, I can attest because I had my first art show because of you. You put me in your show at Pratt, your first show. You put me and Tony McKissick in your show. That was yeah. like my very first New York art show. I had my first yeah. New York art show because of you. And as far as the emerging artists, like you were interconnected, you know, as far as the city was concerned. My first uh, other main show in New York was because of you too. And that was at um, the, it was at- um, was, that, was that Fat Farm? No. No, it wasn't at Fat Farms. It was the one at, um, uh, what was it called? It was in, about emerging artists. It was at, um, oh, I can't think of his name. Photographer, uh, had oh. Manhattan. Um, oh, can't remember now. Can't remember his name. Right. But, but, you know, and then you went on to like work with, uh, Rush Arts, and then wind up, as Danny stated, becoming the director of the gallery. How was that being the director I, of the gallery? I, you know, I just thought of something as, as you were going on. One, and I thought of how to, you know, to frame what Derek did, uh, who's present there. Derek, all the people that Derek were hanging out were going to graduate art schools or some great mm -hmm. art schools. And so he brought a intellectualism about how to look at the world. Uh, through the lens of artists that were seeking this through education and through, you know, what happened was that there was such interaction among these young people that, you know, all, Yale was talking to Columbia and Columbia was talking to Pratt and all of this intellectual discourse about the nature of art and the state, the state of art was going on because he, that's where he was and he brought that to the gallery and it really made it a place for new ideas and new thoughts to be not brought there, but even hatched there. Yeah. Well, we had like such an interesting, I mean, it was a work in progress from the beginning because when it first started, I was just the exhibition manager and we were showing like a lot of great artists. So, and the most of the artists were mid-career at the time, some were senior, but they were artists that I had very little knowledge of. And I learned a lot about that work. And I really felt that I was advancing as an artist because before uh, working at Rush, I interned at City Hall at the Art Commission. 
and I worked under the art commissioner as an intern until she uh, helped to, uh, to get me a freelance position installing exhibitions in the corridor of City Hall. And that's kind oh, of- I remember that, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's how I first learned like just the business of installing the show, making labels, doing all that stuff. And so when I had an opportunity to come to the gallery and help, I had a little bit of uh, experience with just installing things and kind of organizing things. But I felt like the community um, for like the more established artists, although we did a great job trying to install that work and we did the best we could, but a lot of those artists were at a certain age where they had had a lot of shows already. Right. They wanted to sell art. And they thought that, you know, having a show at Rush um, would help to, help to promote their work to sell it. But we were a nonprofit space in an area where only two two or three other galleries were and we were a black gallery so the odds of us selling price the work that they were uh, asking for which they deserved and more we just didn't have the audience and so for me the reason why i started getting more focused on the younger artists is because they had less expectation about having a show their idea was just i want to have a show i want to put my work on the wall maybe have my friends come over you know bring my family to see it and maybe you know, maybe somebody might write about it. You know, and I and I kind of felt, you know, because I was a middle person with a more mature and historical artist like Frank Bolin and Ed Clark and those guys, I always felt like I was, they expected more. They were happy for the opportunity to have a show, but they were like, ain't nobody coming in here buying nothing. You know, you make making, you know, that's what I would hear all day, you know, they would just be disappointed because we didn't have the type of catalog they thought they deserved. And these are things that they all, they really did deserve, but we were just starting out we didn't have a big budget for producing a museum quality exhibition. We just had an alternative space. And so it's best um, utilized by young artists because part of the, the structure was not only showing, you know, a limited budget, but we also had limited promotional access. So younger artists were okay with putting flyers around. Yeah, they go, they go around with flyers in their back pocket, handing them out. You know, yeah. young artists are the best advertisers for, of any type of <laughs> a thing, you know, like we had, Lines down the street sometimes. We yeah, had those were super popular, <laughs> you know, they were like definitely down the street. I mean, the artists basically created the the environment based on us allowing them to have shows. For some of them, they've never had a show, and some of them were coming out of art school, undergrad at least, and had never had an opportunity to show in a gallery in in the city. So it was like a great opportunity. Also for me, it was really mirroring what I wanted as an artist. So it was easy to switch to a little bit more professional structure because I started seeing other friends that I started to, to meet who work at these other nonprofit organizations had all of these guidelines structure that they had in place because they were an older organization. And I felt like if I adopted some of those protocols for a submitting work, it would help even make the artist think that they were being part of something more prestigious because you know we didn't have money to give them, but we had, opportunity for people to see their work so right. i just created like a um like a submission that happened once a month once a year so artists would submit stuff we created curatorial structures based on themes of shows that we asked for submission so it became a little bit more structured but you know it was a great opportunity for me because i was also learning about new artists and more um mid-career and more established artists at the same time so i was like in a good place to kind of just be exposed to so many different things at the same time but one of the things that that sounds all structural but derek did some besides bringing the artists he also curated shows that are memorable i mean that really brought these artists to he did a show called it's bigger than hip-hop <laughs> and yeah it was one of the most fantastic shows that that show. we ever had it's bigger yeah. than hip-hop and everybody, this, this, I mean, besides the shows I used to do at, at Annex, we had people like waiting on 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 Tenth Avenue with a line trying to. It get was it. crazy, yeah. And I think that's the show where we showed Kahinde's work with the hair for the first on. time, you know. Yeah, right. the first, first time we, you know. and that's also the first time that we um that Jamel Shabazz right had a public uh, exhibition in a commercial gallery. Um, because he had just retired from being a correctional officer and he brought in right. his photographs, he didn't bring in a um portfolio. People were bringing their actual work into the gallery. So to me that, Take a look at this, <laughs> yeah, he was, like bringing work into the gallery to show me what he wanted to present, you know. So it was like 
at a time where people, you know, when Kahende um, submitted work for a show, you know, the, you know, he mailed slides in. You know, I remember coming to the, um, the, the gallery door and the slides were rested against the door. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know. Slide, I had you pick, you pass that slide package on to me and we made dupes, I think, and I sent some to Russell and all the people. Yeah. We tried, and we did sell one or two of those pieces of Kahende's. So we promoted, you know, a lot of the artists, you know, we found that a lot of the younger um, artists from the, the, the generation that I'm, I'm a part of were really thinking about art in a more in a very strategic and more professional way. They were thinking about uh, con context differently. You know, like at one time we would do like really exciting things for the community and have like a live band performing with the art. And then the younger artists were like, I don't want a live band performing in front of my art. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That, you was, know, that was amazing that we'd have a jazz band and all of that stuff. Right. That was, and that was, come there to well, look at the art. I don't want to watch it. Well, yeah, we, we, we'll, say, we'll say every year it got better and better. And it you, got better you and better. Really did. You really the helped the control. Ride. Artists took control. Yeah. And I, right. and I think a lot of times when you let the artist kind of take control, it can never be totally terrible. Right. No. You know what I'm saying? We <laughs> listen to the artists. That's one right. thing that we learned to do is listen to the artists because they have great ideas of how they want to be represented. Right. You know, um, and I always thought of myself as a vehicle more mm -hmm. than anything else. A vehicle to let people express themselves and their ideas. I mean that was that was the whole point, to give people opportunity. Uh uh, it certainly wasn't for us. We weren't trying to make any money. We we would like to sell the art. Well, but this was not a profit venture for us. This was something that yeah. we were doing out of love for the art and love for our community. And so, you know, it, and, it, well, it, and it also was we had side. It was and we had side to let yeah. the artists. Express and sometimes we had. And sometimes we had. You know, we would ask artists sometimes. You know, what they donate a little bit if they sold something. I mean, most of them didn't. <laughs> um, but every now and then we find an artist who felt, you know, generous enough to like give back to, you know, what we were doing. But it was a really, you know, the money that went in was based on what we were able to do. So that was right. why it's so essential to have support. And then we got the right grants. But I think the highlight of the of the gallery for me was when we when we became the first gallery ever to receive a award by the mayor. For mm -hmm. art. I don't even remember that. Remember, you don't remember that at Apollo? We had to go to Apollo. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And we received an award for for art and culture through. Yeah, um, and, and they were up there, and I had to go up there on the stage, and they had that giant bow constrictor. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, Different organizations around the city got awards, and we got one for the for the art gallery. But there was a museum, the Brooklyn Children's Museum, had this big white python it must have been 30 feet long and so when the uh, commissioner for cultural affairs called me up on the stage to receive this award the guys who got the award before me were standing there for like five of them in a row holding this python and the head was next to me I I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> oh but you know, one, of, one of the things i want to bring we're talking a lot about um this but you know, our family, both his mother and my father and my brothers, were very supportive. It, it's so very important how supportive they were of us doing different things. Yes. Most people would tell you, go ahead, you got to get a job, you got to do this, that, and the other. We were told, do what you can. And that, that real, and what, what moves your heart, that's really important. Yes. That's mm -hmm. really important. And when Derek first came to New York, his mother called me up, who I used to hang out with. So well, Derek was just a baby. But I used to hang out with his mom and his mom's sister. And the cousin Cliffy was my main man that he that he, he talked about. And um, when when she said, I'm sending my boy to you. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sending my son to you. You better take care of him. <laughs> so I got him. And, you know, so he came and, you know, he just became part of the family here. He took care of me for months when I, I had a hip replacement operation. I couldn't walk. Derek lived around the corner. He would come around two, three times a day to check on me to make sure mm -hmm. after school, before school, this, that, and the other. We had, you know, had to make sure that I had what I needed and I was all right. 
So mm. you know, I have big debt of gratitude on a number of levels for my for my, my baby cousin. Mm. Well, you know, also, you know, our family is just a type of family that is just, you know, very um, supportive in, in a lot of ways. And, you know, and when it comes to physical uh, support, we, we always just, you know, we rise to the occasion when it's necessary. And, um, and you know, I can say again, I learned so much just being in New York. I mean, I didn't really know that I was going to learn as much as I did learn, but I'm excited that everything that I had the opportunity to absorb is something that I'm using on a daily basis, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And you know, Derek, Derek, that would be my question too. Like the years that you had being the director and curator at Rush, how did that really translate and inform your artwork and your career now? Like I'm sure it was a great foundation, but how how did it kind of shape it? Well, it's interesting because you know, look me, you know, the way it worked out was really interesting because a lot of the artists that I showed at the gallery happen to be successful artists now. But when I was showing, when I first um, started looking at that work, you know, because I had this submission that people would send stuff in, I was just picking work that I was interested in or work I wanted to learn more about. So, you know, we ended up being friends after the fact of kind of bringing them into um, the gallery and spending time with them. But I learned a lot just about like artist process and the way people think and the way the spaces kind of um, somehow influence the, your, your, the way you engage with certain things and placement of objects. Like I actually became more um, of like, became like more of a scientific study being in the gallery all the time. Cause you got to see like what wall was the strongest wall when you walked in just based on people coming in. And, you know, so you got to know, I got to know a lot more just about, not just about art, making art, but also presenting art and, you know, an idea of placement and, you know, even writing, you know, I started, uh, you know, raising some funds through the, through the gallery to have guest writers write introductions for, press release and also wall signage or wall text. And that was something that I just learned as I um, started to observe other things. So I think all of those things that I used to do, I mean, in the beginning, um, the opening really consisted of, I would rent a U-Haul, I would go pick up the art, I would bring it to the gallery, I would install all the work, I would make all the labels, I would mail out all the invitations, I would pour the wine at the opening. Um, you know, Sam, you would help sometimes with the wine. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't even there yet. Like he didn't come around. Probably oh, just like, like yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, I was doing. You know, and that was just something that was just part of the. And then people would come to the to the to the um, gallery and hang out with me, and the friends would help and do certain things. And then we end up being able to pay people more a little bit at a time. But it started off being just all those things happening all the time. So for me, I always say like, if I could do all those things that I did for all those artists, when it's a really stressful and like overwhelming time for me as an artist, I'm like, if I can do that for all, all those other people, yeah. I can sure do that for myself, you know, because right. that was a lot of work. I yeah, could never do that now. I couldn't do that now. Well, I couldn't do like, old, like all of us. But you know, you know, I just want to say, uh, bring up another aspect that, 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 you know, we really don't talk about, but the important idea uh, that Derek implemented. It's called Gold Rush. And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, while we were busy raising millions of dollars in the Hamptons, it was not... We were... In order to do that, you have to honor certain levels of people. And so we could not honor the people who were creating the culture because the big donors want to see big names. And no matter how big your name is in the arts, it's not going to be as big as a popular person. So the fundraisers, we would have had one artist up there. And the fundraisers in the Hamptons did not focus on the arts. Mm -hmm. It really focused more on raising money through the children's program and, and, and sponsorships and this and that. So Derek, we, we, me, he came to me and said, we got to do something more to uh, really honor our artists. And so he came up with Gold Rush, which was a completely separate event. It was... It was sort of like Rush. We we wanted to make money, but that was not the point. The point was to honor the people that needed to be honored. And so we started the Gold Rush Awards. And Derek and his friends would make different things. One year it was gold chains made out of something. But whatever it was, it was some kind of award made out of gold by an artist. And we would have this in funky places, really cool places, uh, clubs and all kinds of places and, and, and art galleries. 
And all for years we did the Gold Rush Awards and we really honored the people that were creating the culture that we live in instead of uh, 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 along with the other thing which honored the people who could give us the money. Yeah, because you know the big um, the big awards were really more about the draw. Who were the guests? You know, people came also not just for the work, just for the for the purpose, but they also came because you know certain people were performing, certain right. uh, celebrities mm -hmm. were being honored, so their friends came and those things came. But when we did Gold Rush, we honored a lot of we honored a lot of grassroots people who you know started nonprofits. You know who um, you know a few years ago, and they were. You know, just working really hard and getting some visibility, but needed to have a lot, a bigger platform, or an artist, a singer, or something who, you know, who felt we felt were was kind of in line with what we believed in as an organization. So it was a whole other, um, other uh, community that would um, be represented in these uh, the Gold Rush Award, but also it was just a di different type of energy, um, and it was cheaper. It was a cheap. It was a cheaper ticket. <laughs> it was a lot you know? cheaper. It was a big, you know, because it wasn't really about making money. It was, it was about not losing money. Right. Yeah. The, 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 uh, basically, the biggest, the biggest expense was renting a place. That was the biggest expense. Yeah, you know, and, and that was the main also, thing. Also, because of the great reputation that Rush did, had garnered, people, uh, clubs, and different galleries would want to have their thing, this thing yeah. there, mm -hmm. because we'd have the great artists there. We'd have all kinds of stuff there. But it really, it really was an important innovation and sort of helps to model what we do today as far as not just awards, but you know, the grassroots re thing is what's really the important part. Those, those artists who are not reaching the heights that they want, but have to be have to have, be seen, have to be expressed, who, who represent communities, all different kinds of communities. And so, you know, the, 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 what we're doing now is in the spirit of gold rush all year round, right. especially here in Philly. In Logan, you know, you two are actually uh, answering a lot of the questions that we had. Uh, that we had, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, see, I see Denise sitting back there really quiet, but yeah, it's like you guys are like answering the questions before we even ask them, which is good. Well, and just yeah. to go back really quickly, Derek, the, the guy I was thinking about is Malik Yusuf, his spot. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, Thought Thought Forms Underground. Thought Forms yeah, Underground. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was a very. I got something I want to show you. Right. So that emerging art show you did there was my first. Yeah, that was amazing. Oh, that was amazing yeah. pro, um, yeah. project they yeah. did. Like those guys, they were basically what really brought me to New York, Thought mm -hmm. Forms Underground, because it was such a great vibe and such a great community. Right. They had like live band performing, they had art, they had like, you know, a lot of like cool, uh, creative people hanging out there. It was definitely something that I think. Uh, influence the way that I thought about having a leadership role in the arts. Yeah. I, you know, I totally, I totally believe that Dog Forms Underground was definitely a major influence on art, the art community. Oh, yeah. Like, it was a free people like uh, most definitely come to Thought Forms mm -hmm. Underground. Yeah, I mean, it was like I had a space called Attics before Rush, and it was on Hudson Street on the other side of Broadway, almost perpendicular to it was yeah. Thought Form Underground. And so people would either be at Rush or Thought Form Underground, and sometimes we coordinate and go back and forth between each other in downtown Tribeca. It was an amazing place. Um, and it was- They stayed open late. And, and they were underground. Late. It was in the basement. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it was, yeah. so they would leave Annex and they would go to Thought Form for like later after after the um, opening event. Yeah. You know? So it was like this thing where it was really, because I mean, my impression from coming to New York at that time in the '90s, um, I felt like no one was really selling art. It wasn't really about that. I mean, people, we, were, we were producing culture, man. <laughs> yeah, people wanted to, but it wasn't the main draw. I felt like people kind of realized that okay, we're not selling art, so let's just have fun. And so they, were, they were engaging with art, right? They were engaging with the art. They were. They, they, yeah, they was, were the art. Yeah, mm -hmm. what right. it was like the eighties were the eighties were the big boom, right? The eighties yeah, were the yeah, big boom yeah. as far as economy something? and everything. Like art and Barkley, wait, wait, let me show you something. So Derek's okay. career over as an artist has morphed many places to where he's at now. But he started doing some really amazing things uh, uh earlier in his career. <laughs> and he did these condensed milk cans. Which way do I I remember those, yeah. I have a pyramid full of these called Mother's Milk. 
Can you see? Uh, I hold this right. Oh, no, move it, move it over. Move it, there yeah. Go. I, Other way, there. there yeah. Go. And I have a pyramid full of them in my living room uh, of these, these cans. And it's just, it was, it's just some of the creative things that he's done. This career. I have hanging upstairs from the ceiling a do rag with Mickey Mouse ears. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so when we talk about new and innovative ideas about how to look at art, the guys that we were showing early on were painters, they were sculptors, they were this, they were that, and they were excellent at it. Mm -hmm. People come, came in and started changing the way what became art. And yeah. things like this milk can with this label that he created you know, and called Mother's Milk. It has so many political and social uh, connotations that's going on in this thing. And then and it's, it's just basically a computerized label that he slapped on a bunch of cans. And it is it's like some of the most creative stuff. And so these are the type of things that young and, 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 and people who are actually thinking about what they're saying in their art are starting to come, were coming up with. It was one of the reasons why there was a pipeline up the chain to uh, to art stardom that a lot of people, it went from graduate school or undergraduate school to Rush to the Studio Museum and then out into the world. And it seemed like every year that's exactly what happened to a lot of these artists that everybody's talking about today. Right, right. So, so or some residency, but Studio Museum is probably the iconic one that a lot of people went to. Right. Mm -hmm. Totally. So, totally. So, so Derek, you've uh, you completed a, com a mission for Harlem Hospital Pediatric, right? Mm -hmm. uh, unit um, did a, a, a mural. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, I basically did a wallpaper um, design for the for six rooms in the children's emergency ward, um, right. Harlem Hospital. So these these uh, watercolors were basically uh, transformed into a uh, wallpaper image, but mm -hmm. they were small works that I made and then trans, uh, you know, uh, scanned them together to create a pattern. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, I had to think about you know who the audience. You know, I think I think working at a gallery, you become really aware of who the audience is, right? Because you really have you're dealing with the audience every day. And I remember when we, when I was curating shows at Rush, I would always do a show that was more of like a more pop show, like a more show that was like a lot of entertainment, a lot of some performance. You know, the name of the show would mm -hmm. kind of um, represent that, and you know, in the way that the framing of the show was. And there was there were shows where they were more on a heavier intellectual side, where you know that appealed to another type of audience. You know, I tried to like really spread out. You know, the conversation happening because I wanted to show the diversity within Black culture just amongst us as mm -hmm. creatives and how we all have very particular interests in everything from the um, sci-fi to, you know, to um, real life um, narrative. So it was really interesting to kind of really think about that as an artist. I think about it now when I'm doing work or being commissioned to do work. I look at the neighborhood it's in. I look at the audience, I look at, you know, the age group. I mean, with my own work, you know, I'm not as always speaking about, like in my work in my studio, that's for a commercial space, you know, there's a certain level of freedom to also not care as much about audience because, you you know, people also buy things because they like the object. Right. But when you're dealing with like a commission project, I was really trying to remove my artist ego out of the equation and really think about what kids wanted to see um when you know something i made so i was really thinking about how this, how can i strip everything really strip it down mm -hmm. and make it more about the pleasure of being in a space right. and seeing like these things floating around so i was really focused on separating the figure from the flotation device and have the kids kind of imagine right. themselves on it mm -hmm. versus, you know seeing somebody on it they have to be really pleased with this. yeah they're really cool and both of you, I think, are doing murals with Philadelphia. Denise, 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 before you go there, I wanted yeah. to ask Erica a, a few other things before we went into the, yeah. the mural stuff. 
because he just talked about what he he did with the space and and for, you know for the children. But he's worked a lot with like um, spaces and. Uh, I remember going to see one of your shows uh, in 2019 in Terrier Life, uh, Luxembourg. Um, oh, Diane. Gallery. Yeah, and that was amazing. You And what you did with that space was amazing. You want to explain that a little bit? Uh, so I was invited to do a space in a brownstone in the Upper East Side. And it was a narrow brownstone. I think it's the most one of the narrowest brownstones in, that, in the Upper East Side. And um, it was converted into a gallery. And so I decided to create space in a narrow room by um, by creating wallpaper that um, that represented interior spaces and the things that kind of resided in this interior space. And so I made the whole a perspective from um, from um, person from first person um, really flattening out the plane and showing less dimension as if you were standing right in the middle of each room. And so I did it in, in three or four rooms, three floors. Mm -hmm. wallpaper wall on each floor and that's kind of when i first started really getting into the idea of wallpaper right about the audience and how wallpaper can also play like another uh another part in your subconscious as a viewer because you don't really look you look at wallpaper as de decoration you really don't look at it as like a main source of imagery you look at it as like a backdrop mm -hmm. but if that backdrop was somehow seductive enough for you to look at it when you wanted to versus coming into the space, looking at it as an art piece, then you may actually gain more um, interest in the subject and have more space to kind of roam around the way we roam around like decorative wallpaper. And some wallpapers have some other subversive uh, material inf infused in them. I kind of think about that as wallpaper is something that could be used as, again, as something that is about beauty, but also something about insight. So mm -hmm. this is actually one of the images for, from the, from the, I guess the family room. Right. I also hung original artwork on the wall. Um, all the drawings are like portraits were original works that I put on the wall on top of the wallpaper as if um, the images on the wall were a reflection of the people who lived, who occupied the spaces where the decor. I also put like um, menus from different um, soul food restaurants on the kitchen, wallpaper from like mm -hmm. you know, sweet potato pie and, you know, different, you know, people who kind of make these things that, um, because my whole thing is like a lot of times black culture and people who occupy black culture don't really think of that culture as it is kind of um, aesthetic marvel of mm -hmm. something to study and to understand as being very important because a lot of the things come very easy uh, based on your cultural perspective and your way you grow up and all those things. But I learned, you know, going to grad school and going to, and going to art school that these are also um, very unique uh, ways of, um, of communicating that are, have been um, somehow studied in universities around the world. And I think a lot of people don't really think of that when they think about the things they're doing in their neighborhood. Right. At, um, and so I want to bring all that into art and kind of put that um, out there for the viewer to kind of, rummage around and understand certain things that are familiar, but also the place that I put them in kind of gives them another level of um, of exaltation. But I put them in a space that a gallery space is used for people to pay attention to what they're looking at versus like at home, you're not looking at menus on the table or on the thing unless you're cooking. But if I put it in the gallery on the wall, then people are gonna have to look at it and think about what it means or the significance of it and those things. So. The wallpaper played a really good um, um, introduction to a lot of things I'm interested in. Right. And I saw that online. What did you do with the wallpaper after the exhibit was over? Were you um, able to save just, it? No, we just tore it. We just got rid of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm actually using one of the images from the wallpaper to um, do a project with some kids for um, um, coming up. So. A lot the wallpaper of, is stored in a computer somewhere anyway. It can be redeemed. Yeah, yeah. The things that can't be the things that can't be replaced are the original drawings that were on the wall. Right. So when I was right. asked when I was asked to do oh, and also collage on top of the wallpaper. So a lot of the things on the wallpaper are not only in the image, but I I responded to the wallpaper by um, collaging elements on them that can't be repeated. Mm -hmm. Well I have to do it yet. You know, like on the table in the kitchen. 
Yeah, like the videos. All people could remain the same, but the whole thing yeah. changed because of the different environment. You yeah. 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 Response to a different environment. Right. So it was. It was. Uh, I really enjoyed that particular show, and then you know, I actually stayed for a while and watched the different you know groups come in, and as they spoke, and I would follow them up. And yeah. It was yeah. So funny because I know you personally, yeah. the moderator, how he was speaking and what he was talking about, and I was like, well, yeah. you know. Derek was probably thinking something different. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably, yeah, probably, yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah, it was, that was that was a, a tight show. Thank uh, you, thank you. So, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I cut you off, Denise. You were about to ask a question. No, that was that was a good conversation. Yeah, yeah. So some of the things that y'all are working on now, I know you, we just talked about the hospital commission, and um, I think Danny, you mentioned the mural arts Philadelphia. Are you both mm -hmm. doing murals for that? Um, we, both, we both did them before, right? This is going to be the second yeah, one. This is, this would be my second one, and I think Derek's second one also. Yeah, in Philly. exactly. Um, so, but yeah, um, we, I, mine, I think we've shown already. Uh, Derek's probably is not in production yet because they just really had this conversation a couple of months ago. So, um, but yeah, I mean, Philadelphia has over three thousand murals in it, and the mural pro arts pro program gets really, really great artists to go into all over the city, all over the city, and create these wonderful murals. And uh, so uh, year before last, we honored Jane Golden, who's the head of the mural arts program, for all work that she's done on behalf of the community. Um, and so, you know, she's Derek's a great artist. He'd probably be back for a third or fourth, I don't know. No, she's awesome. She's yeah. awesome. I, I did a piece that's on near Six and Diamond right now. And it was a piece mm -hmm. that I... I created maybe three or four years ago, right. um, and it was a great experience working with them because I also worked with the kids from mm -hmm. uh, the neighborhood, so that they helped me work on the beginning parts of the mural. Um, and I got to meet with them and talk to them about ideas, and they kind of fueled the the progress and the direction of the mural I made. Mm -hmm. And so this time, I'm hoping that we can kind of think about the space that we're going to put everything, how it can relate to the community the kids who are around, the people who are around it. So we're kind of looking at areas and scouting out stuff and thinking about what would be the best fit for the image. Mm -hmm. So talking about Jane Golden, she's actually, we're actually shooting her. She's gonna be saying a few choice words uh, about you, Derek, because you're being honored for uh, uh, the 25th anniversary of Arts for Life. Wow. And the fact that she worked with, um, you know, the both of you is, is, is um, you know, a reason that, uh, you know, we asked her to, to come and say something, but she's going to come and, and, and say a few choice words about you. So, you know, okay. Right about that. Yeah. She's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. And then Danny, I think you have an announcement on um, something that is coming up for you that you've just found out about. That sounds really well, exciting. Well, two things. Uh, one just happened today and, and one happened last week. Um, Early in my early, probably the first real art show I had was at Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning out in Queens, where I grew up, and um, they've been there 50 years, uh, art wow. and culture and this, that, and the other. And they asked me to be their artist in residence for the year uh, to help them celebrate 50 years. Uh, and I said, sure. I mean, you know, but then it developed into a lot more because it's not just me doing an art show and being honored, but they wanted to explore the breadth of some of the things I've done. So, you know, last year I had a CD come out on Blue Note Records with Ron Carter. And so they've asked me to put together a jazz poetry thing where my new book of poetry will be explored on stage. I'm working on that now. And then with a jazz person, hopefully it'll be Ron Carter, but if not, we have another uh, trio set up. Uh, and then the thing that happened today, oh, and also uh, to dovetail on that, uh, the executive producer of Deaf Poetry, they want to do a Deaf Poetry reunion at their theater. So during the year, I'll be creating a Deaf Poetry reunion, um, de debuting my new book of poems and paintings, or drawings, actually, and um, in, in a jazz concert, and creating a Deaf Poetry. And, so, and then I'm creating 20 new pieces of artwork uh, over the year for an exhibition. So that, that's that. But today, uh, I was asked by the great uh, 
writer and literary person and activist and an and outspoken person, Ishmael Reed, mm. to co-curate uh, the Black Lives Matter issue of Tribes magazine, which is one of the iconic magazines of culture um, uh, that is not mainstream, but is seriously awarded to have and so they asked me to do the visual arts, be the visual arts curator for that issue. So that should be fun. Uh, and, you know, working with Ishmael Reed, I, I mean, his writing influenced my writing so much uh, after I read the freelance Paul Bearers in college that uh, I still call him my favorite uh, writer, uh, contemporary writer. <laughs> so me and, me and, me and Ishmael Reed uh, are going to be working on the Tribes magazine that was started by the great poet uh, and, and cultural activist, Steve Cannon. So, so, so you're, you're curating like 25 artists for the magazine, right? I think about 25. Right. And one of the things that I'm going to do, um, I have some artists in mind already, um, but one of the things I <coughs> want to do and always want to do is put it out to the world. So at least half of those artists I would like to get from submissions, yeah. from social media, where people who could submit things mm -hmm. and have an independent panel look at it um, to give people the opportunity to get their work out there. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things that are happening with me and, and weaving and bobbing and ducking COVID, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's a strange time. That's a, yeah, that's amazing. That, like you said, that uh, the magazine is oh, definitely- and I voted. I've already voted. Oh, yeah, yeah. I voted. Right. My, right. my, my, my <laughs> vote has been registered. My vote nice. has been registered already. So, I mean, you know, besides, you know, being a pundit on Facebook, uh, finding all the dirtiest and trifling memes about Trump I can find and putting them up there and have people laugh at him. I think <laughs> <laughs> I take great delight in that. Uh, so, I, you know, it, it's good. Um, life is pretty good, man. I'm having a good time and I'm doing <laughs> great work. So I'm, I'm happy. It seems like you all are both really still going full steam, no matter, you know, with everything kind of slowed down and, and distanced. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I, I, there's a gallery here. Uh, I just realized that today. Uh, there's a gallery here called In Liquid um, that's in the Crane Arts Building. Uh, they just contacted me about doing a show in January. Um, and I've created all this work during COVID that had no place to go. So I'll probably have a solo show here in Philadelphia in January. So nice. yeah. things are going along. Well, yeah. yeah, COVID don't stop no show; it just alters it. Well, I think you know artists are able to work in isolation, so that's always a right. good, you know. Right. For most artists, you know. Right. You're used exactly. to. Exactly. So, yeah. Derek, before you came on, we we were talking a little bit about the um, about Rush Art's 25th anniversary. And uh, basically, you being an honoree, and of course, we have uh, three other honorees and uh, a special award. And I, I don't know if you, if you actually know, but I'm actually producing the, the, the first virtual award slash fundraiser uh, for it. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, congrats. And, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And congratulations to you for um, you know uh, winning an award this year. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'll be getting in contact with you soon about about that, about the award. Danny, um, we're coming towards, almost towards the end. Do you wanna uh, you know, once again say a little bit about the, uh, about uh, well, Extra Life? I mean, let me, let me just say a little bit about the fundraiser. It's, it's because uh, I, I need to take every opportunity to uh, uh, talk about the fundraiser. It'll be on uh, online and Facebook Live and a million other platforms, hopefully on the 21st of, of November. And, you know, Bancale was chosen because of how well he puts these stream yard things together, him and his team. And I said, wow, if he can do this, basically the fundraiser is going to be very similar to a situation like this where we go from one camera to the other. So, I mean, the way I conceived it, Bancale was a perfect person. But we are honoring Derek. Uh, for all the reasons we just talked about for the last hour, or however long we've been talking, uh, we're honoring Dawu Bay, who is an amazing photographer, has a feature this week in the New York Times Magazine uh, about him, uh, MacArthur Genius Award winner, uh, and 
we went to the same high school with friends. We used to ride the same bus to, to school. So Dawood is making so many great moves in the art world. He is a photographer of, of worldwide renown. Amazing. So so we, we got Dawood. Uh, then we're honoring uh, Reginald uh, Brown. And Reggie Brown is a, a philanthropist that supports many artists and arts organizations here in Philadelphia. He's the vice chairman of the board of Del uh, directors of PAFA. Uh, Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And uh, then we're honoring the scholar and, and also photographer, but, but uh, the great intellect, Deborah Willis, uh, for her work in advancing scholarship, uh, mostly around photography, but just heightening the awareness of the black arts throughout her career. Uh, she's also a dean, a dean of the art school at uh, NYU. So, uh, we're, uh, I, maybe she's the dean. I know she's a, a professor. They don't know me, Deb but um, so we got Deb Willis, and then um, the director of the African American Museum here, Patricia Aiden Wilson, or Patricia Wilson Aiden. Um, I always invert her name. She stepped down and is moving on to another position somewhere, and she has been the director ever since I got here, and has transformed the museum uh, into like a great contemporary art space that is happening here. Uh, and so she's leaving and we want to give her an award for um, for great service to the arts community here in Philadelphia. So that's what we're doing and we're begging for money. Just, you know, and we got a great art auction. Uh, Derek has given us a wonderful piece and Dawood and Ming Smith and uh, uh, so many other artists, I, I, I can't even, and we have some great people on the committee. We have Susan, um, Susan Kahan, who's the Dean of Tyler. We have, um, we have, um, Brooke Anderson, who's the uh, director of the museum at PAFA. We have Larry Osimensa, who is a internationally known curator and al also another person that Derek brought to my attention who got his curatorial start at Rush. Um, uh, so, uh, or at least one of his early big shows. So, I um, mean, and there's a million more people. We have Yolanda Caraway, who's a political mover and shaker and is very busy with this election, but Yolanda's on, is on, and we got Mark Gibson, who's a great artist and a professor at Tyler. We got about Embarrassment Booth, who runs the Petrucci Collection, uh, who's the curator for that. So we have a wonderful group of people and of course your friend Denise Rhonda Matheson who's the CFO of the High mm -hmm. uh, but she's also a member and who was on this show with us not too long ago is also a member of our host committee so we got we, we got it going on and Broncolet is pulling it all together for us well well me and a, and a, a host of uh you know like you said a, a team and we, we we don't know specifically if it's going to be through um yard stream yet I didn't have it made in my mind about oh, that. So whatever the case may be, it's going to be super tight. So, um, But um, you, before we go, Derek, uh, I know Denise had uh, mentioned uh, about some of the, the TV shows that your work has been on uh, recently. And you know, like, uh, like uh, Issa Rae's Insecure. Uh, what else, Denise? Um, well, and I love that you have found such a great way to get art in front of a broader audience, which is something that I always aspired to do. And really, you know, it's just great to see it in front of a lot of people. So um, the show Empire, Beyonce's um, big video, Black is King and Insecure are the three I know of. Um, and if you can tell us a little bit about how you kind of got in that realm, it's been a great opportunity but the work looks incredible that you're showing thank you i mean i learned i mean i think after you know as i just matured as an artist i really learned this you know although my work has changed a lot and it's kind of morphed into a lot of different things i'm really interested in the idea of black identity and consumerism consumerism is like something that i've noticed is is, is a is a common thread through all the things that i'm working on the objects i make the video i produce the things I've made somehow deal with this idea of consumption in some ways, even if it's idealistic. It, um, and I think that it appeals to uh, audiences who kind of relate to it in some aspect. And I think that's how it ends up on um, a lot of media um, 
not just in galleries, but also, um, you know, in music videos and and television shows. I feel like sometimes it's fitting, or most of the time it's fitting in the context of the ask I get, you know, the, the people who ask me for permission to use the images for whatever, or rent the images or rent the work or whatever. I feel like a lot of the conversation with my work fits with a lot of the intention they have um, with placing the work in the show. So I think that it has a, a good alignment with some of my ideas and some of their ideas of, of presenting the black uh, figure in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the, the way, I think that's the common thread that draws a lot of, um, I guess, uh, people who work in film or television when they think about what artists they want to present in the context of their show. Because I'm also interested in works not necessarily being just a backdrop for the show, but also somehow in conversation or relating to the narrative of the video or of the exhibition. And so mm -hmm. I'm always happy to see the work being presented. Well, right. and on Empire, that really happened. Didn't, didn't they write it into the script in some way? Yeah, I didn't know they did. I didn't know it. I didn't know. I didn't, we didn't, they didn't ask me. What show was that? <laughs> Empire. Okay. If they, you know, they they had contacted me to ask me. They commissioned me to do a painting for their billboards because they wanted to do something more creative instead of doing the photographs. So they asked me whether I do a portrait of the two characters. And so I looked at a lot of uh, lobby cards from a lot of older uh, black cinema, a lot of romance stuff like Carmen Carmen Jones, and you know, I looked at a lot of those things for for visual inspiration to think about how I can uh, communicate some of those ideas of romance and epic um, um, representation. Um, and so I looked at that for inspiration. And so I kind of drew it from that and made this piece and they uh, use it as a billboard, but then they wanted me to come on the show as, you know, write me on to the show in some ways about, you know, artist studio or something, I don't know. But I was not as um, keen on, you know, being um, on a TV show as a character. Uh, so, um, so, one day, I, I someone texted me saying, your painting's on the show. And I'm like, what? And all of a sudden, they wrote, they wrote it into the script of the show. And it lasted for some time through the um, through that season where the, <laughs> the show was the subject of the show. I Miss mean, painting was the subject of the show. Um, and um, it was definitely great advertising. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, a lot of people, you know, and then they asked me, could they create merchandise to, to uh, sell, to give to nonprofit organizations wow. in, uh, you know, in the urban communities. And so, I mean, you gotta, you know, some things you gotta just compromise and, you know, and think of a lot of other things happening. So I feel like when you work with television or fashion or whatever, there's a lot more compromise than when you work directly with a gallery or right. a museum, you know, because a lot of their intentions are not always the same as what we intend our work to be presented or how it's being presented or you know you have to you have to really negotiate a lot in order to get the outcome you want did you know that your, your work was going to be in beyonce's black is king uh um it was a docu that was a documentary right on hbo right yeah it was like kind of a, a like a doc video music video with like a bunch it was like almost like a long story right with videos um, I knew it was going to be on a, when, I mean, her people reached out to the gallery I work with and asked could they um, represent the work in a music video project that Beyonce was working on, but they totally couldn't tell me what it was for or when it was going to happen. It was a super secret. Um, but they, you know, one of the things that people always say a lot with me is like, they say like, oh, it's going to be complimentary. You know, <laughs> people, you know, sometimes you don't know what they're going to do. They could make a, a show making fun of your work, you know, <laughs> you saying, you know, um, so they could be complimentary. And, you know, I didn't know, again, I don't, a lot of times you work with the, with these, um, networks, you don't know until you're, until the show airs. Right. You know, you don't know. And on Insecure, I saw it for the first time on, um, on the airplane. Right. And they, when they did like a preview of what's coming up the next show and they <laughs> had my exhibition at, um, California African American museum, it happened to be up. Right. And Ray worked at that museum wow. when she was younger. So she was doing site visits looking for, you know, scenes to shoot a you know, shoot in. You know what? So how did Ray work at that museum? 
Huh? I'm sorry to cut you. And I was about to tell you um, how Issa Rae started working at the museum, but I'll tell you after you're done. Yeah. So anyway, you know, that's how I ended up doing it. And so, I mean, so a lot of things happen like that. It's, I'm usually really reluctant to do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm like the opposite person to do stuff like that. I'm a little bit more like more um, inclined to say no. Right. Um, but, you know, you picked good ones to go with. Yeah, great <laughs> one. I think when you say no a lot, then people who have really who have the quality gets better. Right. You know, we say no a lot because we because you when you, say, when you say yes to something that's mediocre, that's what is the platform that you're going to be seen on. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I usually say no a lot of the times because not because it's um, good or bad. It just has to do with the thing that's so great about art is that if you have that one image, that one object, then people have to come to your house to see it. Right. Or to the mm -hmm. gallery to see it, or the museum to see it. And I think that's more special to me, honestly. Mm -hmm. that people have to come to your house and they see it in your house. And that's what art used to be at one point. You would have to come to a person's you know, location to see a piece of art that they really like. And people would talk about it. I remember people would tell Danny, like, I really love um, you know, this painting you have on your wall. Or I really love the African sculpture you have in the living room or the Ed Clark or, you know. And so that, you know, to me, I always thought about art in that way. And I want to tell you something funny, Danny, that, um, that, um, you know, when I, you know, when I started working with you earlier, you know, you had that book on um, Albert Chung, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and you know, I love that photograph. I love that that book that you know that he had like a little catalog or something from a show. So he he so he finally um, decided to make a more high end version of that that series. You know, the series with the spiritual, the, the skulls and the mystic right. and all that. And so you know, I, I always wanted one of those photographs, like. From the time he had the book, I was like, "When I get money one day, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna buy an Albert Chung photograph." Well, I sent him a message on Instagram, you know, because I follow him on Instagram, and I sent him a message, and I said, "I said, um, I would love to get." I said, "I don't know if you have a photograph from that series anymore, but I would love to get a photograph from that series." And he said, "Oh my God, I can't believe that Derek Adams want to buy one of these people." And I said, "I first saw your work at Danny's, you know, when I was." younger guy you know and i was flipping through the book and i didn't even think i'll be able to afford one of your photos and he said to me he said i picked the photo i wanted and he said you know what that photo is actually hanging on my wall in my my house i'm gonna take it off the wall and i'm gonna send it to you wow. damn that's so dope wow. you know that is dope dope so we talk all we communicate all the time now wow when you talk to albert chung tell him i said hello man i will i will so i wanted to go back to the um the museum oh wow Give a little no, okay. Pretty, pretty quick with these pictures. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I know you quick. I know. I know. It's like a little pop up. <laughs> it's like VH1 pop up. <laughs> but I, I didn't even know he had a picture. He was ready. See? I'm, I'm trying to right there. Yeah, he's ready. Right. 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 Colorado. I, I, I curated for Cam Museum. Uh, I, okay. I curated an exhibit called How We Roll. And I hired Issa uh, for that museum to do the, the commercials for uh um for that that show that i curated well it was me and, and three other curators so that's how that was Easter's original connection to oh okay cam museum so i was just trying to get yeah. a plug out there the whole section and then when we were in in uh the hamptons in 2013 for um for rush arts i was uh, she had called me danny remember and i was trying to you probably don't remember 2013 but I was try I, I put you on the phone with her because she was. This is before she became Issa Rae. But I had uh, starred in a, um, one of her her web series called The Choir. So I'm I'm actually sending you the link, Derek. You, you're okay, I would love to see it. Love yeah. to see it. Right. So, so, so talking about this family, Denise. Like if you if you think about it, you know how many um, successful successful artists are in this one family, and do you get that like? You know, normally, right? Mm -hmm. So I think even with Derek's uh, uh, sister, who is another, you know, she's an artist, she's a writer. I think she's working on her third book. Uh -huh. right. It's like an anthology with all of the other. Yeah. Uh, she organized this thing called Zora's Den as a as a it's a writing workshop and uh, collaboration with um, black women writers, and they're publishing their first anthology, which are selected um, short stories from a bunch of. 
our writers who are part of the workshop. So she's doing that. So that's our third book with them. She has two books before. And then her son, my nephew, my nephew uh, Lawrence Bernie, is a writer. The writer. writer. Yeah, he's a really he's right. a really good writer. And I have a great niece. She's a lawyer, you know, you know <laughs> justice. She's like she's like really a criminal, you know, focused on you know a lot of important social political issues in her practice. So it's like you know, I feel like a lot of my family has a certain level of uh, awareness of what's going on in the world right. and responding to it in a way that I think is is positive. And, um, and reflective in a good way, you know. So you guys, I agree. yeah, I agree. you guys kind of reflect. Everybody like, has, has a sense of social consciousness in all the work they do. I mean, you know, it, it's not done in isolation of just the work. It's done with a, a larger community in mind when you do it. You know, when you mm -hmm. create the work, when you create projects, when you create something like Zora's Den. You know, yeah. it's about uplifting yourself along and uplifting a lot of other people along with uplifting yourself. Yeah, you know, it's about, you know, it's really, you know, it's it's not even that, you know, we have a really large family. So, you know, I understand the idea of community from that level and it kind of expands into more of the family you choose based on, you know, the, the things that you um, share that are not through blood uh, relations, but through you know, common interest and compassion and and interest in and in supporting the community. So it's you know I it, it kind of spilled into so many things that are just more beneficial, I think for me, as an artist to have this type of um, family structure and then how it kind of spills into this community involvement or community engagement, which I think kind of balances every balances everything out. Well, I know people love hearing these kind of stories, and I think it really is inspiring to people. So I really appreciate you guys sharing, you know, these backstories, and I've enjoyed hearing them a lot. Thank you. Well, you know, even though we're on this this, this this platform, I haven't seen Derek face to face in maybe about a year. So this was the yeah. cool to catch up even this way. I know, um, right? <laughs> I'm going to Baltimore in a couple of days uh, on Wednesday, and he's going to be there. So we're going to be able to catch up in person, uh, nice. socially distant with masks on or something. But we're going to be able to catch up for a few minutes. Uh, maybe, 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 maybe you can come by and check out the um, the residency I'm working on. That's what I want to do. My yeah. appointment with Uncle Leonard is at 1.30, so I'll call you right afterwards. Okay. And nice. Vicky said she wants to be there, so. Okay. You can get a whole tour. You know? right now. So <laughs> oh, no, this is uh, this is very it should be very organic, you know, especially when you're dealing with the family. Vicky uh, Denise is Derek's sister. The, the writer okay. we talked about. Um, All right, so I'm getting ready to go eat dinner. Can we get off now? Great way to end this segment. Yeah. So, <laughs> I don't want to know to say that. <laughs> So Thank Denise, you, Derek. I yeah. know how busy you are, and you know uh, to take the time out to do this. Um, it, 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 it was important to me and important to this production. But I really appreciate you jumping off a train and running home and jumping on the computer. That's you know? all good. No, I enjoyed it. Also, got, I got to. I just remember I got to send Diggy a, a, um, a print. Oh he yeah, I sent Diggy a print um, of one of my works last week. They hit me up. Your print and Diggy a print. Okay, I gotta send. I gotta send. Diggy hit me up for one. Sometimes I'm sending them something. I'll well, send you're them. a good boy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, nice. You're a good boy. So, um, oh, with your that, mother would be proud of you. Mm -mm. Yeah. Well, she was proud of you anyway. All right, guys. Thank okay. you. Well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you for coming on. We really appreciate you. Uh, with that being said, uh, thank you, guys. Good night. Thank, you. Great. Thank, you. thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. So, yeah. so I guess um, that was a that was a great show, right? Uh, it really was. Yeah, I think we could have talked on and on, except everybody was getting hungry and thirsty. But I think <laughs> and like, all right, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes me wish I could have been to some of the early shows. I love this kind of shows, so it was awesome. So our, our next show uh, is, and uh, we may have to push that that day. You know, you know, I actually gave um, Dominic the wrong date. For the slide. Right there. It's November eighteenth. 
I the the next show so far is planned for a Wednesday, um, right. November eighteenth, not the twenty first. But regardless, we will advertise when we have our next show for November, and it's going to be with um, Danny's Fine Art Publisher, um, Mike Warlow, and we'll talk a lot about spoken word poetry and his art books and his new book that's coming out and all of those topics. Okay. Well, um, this has been a great show of Chain Letters. And until next time, uh, enjoy some new uh, some artists, some new artist artwork. I enjoyed it tonight. Thank you so much, Bacalay. And goodbye, everybody. <laughs> goodbye. Bye.